Thank you so much. Uh, big thank you to Dr. Banshi Sabu sir for having me in this and the entire team of DiCareCon ha uh, for having me in this uh, session. Uh, two fantastic talks and I think Dr. Suresh's talk was just the stepping stone for this one. Uh, I've had a bit of a tech issue with the slides but then again because of tech help only we rescued the slides. Uh, so let's see how it goes. Uh, I think we are in an uh, amazing era for medical therapy of obesity and needless to say the prevalence is alarming globally as well as in India even though our average may be slightly lower than the global prevalence I think it's burgeoning and uh, needs intensive aggressive and sustainable management. With that, I think just a reminder to uh, all of us that obesity and cardiorenal metabolic diseases are not only interconnected, they coexist and they amplify one another such that the burden on the patient increases, namely type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease and the new focus which is metabolic, associate, metabolic dysfunction associated fatty liver disease. Again, the weight loss targets for comorbidities, if you see uh, even a small magnitude of weight loss is extremely beneficial in metabolic uh, conditions. However, if you want any remission or anything that is sustainable and actually meaningful, it has to be to the tune of 10% and more. With that, just showing you the BMI cutoffs for management of obesity in South Asians and as our respectable chairperson just said, above 30, but the recommendations are that pharmacotherapy to be offered uh, at BMI of 25 and above if presence of comorbidities and this is where our game actually starts. So again, lifestyle intervention we know is the cornerstone of obesity management and we know that everything, all the diets work, but nothing is sustainable and more 80 or 90 percent of the times the weight is regained within the subsequent five years and even the factors which drive this weight regain are well identified. I'm not going into those details and uh, so far we, we know that bariatric surgery was the only option again like Dr. Suresh said giving us 25 to 30 percent of weight loss with long-term weight maintenance because of the hormonal changes uh, however, scalability, acceptance, etc., etc., seem to be the barrier. There is sobering realization across most of our uh, earlier approaches for obesity management that none of them were able to give us even 10% or close to 10% weight loss when chronically administered without side effects. And today we are in an era where our understanding of the gut hormones has increased so much that that led to the uh, discovery, establishment of safety and efficacy of the GLP-1 receptor agonist. And today they are an established class of drugs for obesity, type 2 diabetes and also coming up for MAFID. Uh, two shining examples are semaglutide 2.4 milligrams, the latest approved GLP-1 receptor agonist, resulting in at least 15 to 17 percent weight loss, which was earlier unimaginable. And we have terzipatide, which is the first combination of two hormone agonists approved for diabetes as well as obesity management. Thus, we are in a new era of singular, dual, triple combinations. And so far, again, just to show you quickly, we were always playing in that up to 10% uh, weight loss, uh, you know, zone, and nothing was even close to surgical benefits that we were able to offer our patients. And with terzipatide and semaglutide, 2.4 milligrams, we have shattered that barrier. And that has given way to a lot of uh, new upcoming molecules. So on the backbone of GLP-1, uh, which is the primary incretin hormone that we are talking about here, there are so many other combinations as well as singular agents in the pipeline today that it's really exciting that we will be able to use these preferentially to individualize 
anti-obesity management in our patients. So it's GLP-1 agonist, then you have uh, GIP agonist, the GIP antagonist as well, a myelin agonist, the G glucagon agonist, and then combination of those, and the PYY or peptide YY agonist as well. In terms of action, we have the GLP-1 agonist, which decreases food intake, increases satiety, has glucose-dependent insulin uh, secretion enhancement, decreases glucagon and gastric emptying. And with all the complementary actions uh, or synergistic actions of all the other hormones, we are able to achieve synergistic or even complementary or even beneficial you know, weight loss and other benefits in our patients of metabolic dysfunction. Again, this is, uh, this is a 2024 list of drugs that are in the preclinical and early development phase. You don't have to go into the details because we'll know what is relevant or not in the coming years. But just look at this. There are nine molecules today at either one or uh, you know, higher dose levels in development in phase three for obesity alone. And then we have 10 in phase two, which will soon cross phase two and go into, at least majority of them will go into phase three for clinical development. And if you had any fear of missing out, I've just listed something from 2022 as well, just to show you that there were glucagon analogs, leptin sensitizers, also the GIP receptor agonists, and the uh, PYY agonists, also those that target the ghrelin pathway and other appetite suppressants which were in early clinical development and we, we will be tracking them but they are not very relevant as of today. With that I come to the first class which is the GLP-1 receptor agonist just to update you. We already talked about the effects that GLP-1 receptor agonists cause. We had subcutaneous liraglutide three milligrams once daily and semaglutide 2.4 milligrams at once weekly, both injectable for obesity management, but even a higher dose of subcutaneous semaglutide at 7.2 milligrams is currently being evaluated. Semaglutide in the oral form is also available, which most of you might have used in the practice, and we know that we've got uh, we've got substantial or clinically significant benefits in terms of weight reduction as well as HbA1c reduction. It's only approved for diabetes in India as of now. But moving ahead, we have uh, results from the oral semaglutide at, uh, evaluated at 50 milligrams once daily versus placebo uh, in combination with a moderately intense lifestyle uh, intervention that resulted in weight loss of 17.4% as compared to 1.8% achieved with placebo with corresponding improvements in cardiometabolic risk factors over 68 weeks. We also saw that in those with diabetes, oral semaglutide at 50 milligrams again caused significant weight loss and benefits in HbA1c reduction, something to the tune that we had not seen before. So this is in development, 50 milligrams is being evaluated. There are trials ongoing also in India if you are wondering if that is tolerated well. Next we come to this uh, exciting new class and I call it new class because it's an oral non-peptide uh, non GLP-1 receptor agonist. It's, it's a small molecule. Uh, or for glipron, it's in phase three currently being evaluated for diabetes as well as obesity, two separate programs completely. And uh, how does it work? It's a potent partial GLP-1 receptor agonist uh, towards G protein activation over the beta arrestin recruitment at the GLP-1 receptor. That's how the GLP-1 uh, analog or substrate interacts with the receptor. And there is preclinical evidence already, but today we have even phase two results where uh, there was a dose dependent weight loss of up to 14.7% as compared to just 2.3% with placebo and improvement in other cardiometabolic risk factors as well. 
even in diabetes patients, more than almost 50% have achieved more than 10% of their weight loss, which I told you is the sweet spot for any sustainable or meaningful metabolic advantages. Again, HbA1c reduction of 2.1% as compared to even the standard uh, dulaglutide, which is 1.1%. So fantastic results with orfogliprone. Please await the phase three results. We'll probably get approved after that. There is another molecule of a similar nature from Pfizer, Danugliprone, which is again an oral non-peptide small molecule G protein bias GLP-1 receptor agonist. In people with diabetes and overweight obesity, they found that up to the highest dose given twice daily, there was modest weight loss, but also significant reduction in HbA1c. However, the phase two results were not very encouraging because most of the people or significant number of people discontinued treatment because of side effects. We'll see what the phase three comes out to be. Other uh, enteropancreatic hormones like GIP, glucagon, amylin, peptid YY, all are being uh, leveraged upon and they have diverse metabolic actions and they are being evaluated either singularly or in combination, like I told you, for again weight management, diabetes, and also metabolic dysfunction associated uh, fatty liver disease. GIP agonism. So GIP is the one that the organ-wise effects are given here. It's nothing but a hormone secreted by the K cells in the jejunum in response to food intake. It stimulates insulin secretion, increases glucagon secretion also, increases lipogenesis and enhances the lipid buffering capacity uh, in the different organs. In diabetes, the GIP agonism is diminished and this is what we want to uh, achieve or uh, replete with GIP agonism. Again, phase one study has been okay. The results have been okay, but it seems that this in combination with a myelin or other GLP-1 receptor agonists will be far better. And how can we, uh, how can we deny that? The dual GLP-1 and GIP agonists, the, the blockbuster terzipatide is a classic example, a once weekly subcutaneous unimolecular dual receptor agonist at GLP-1 and GIP. Uh, it's important to understand that it is five times, uh, it is comparable with the native GIP for its action on the GIP receptor, but five times lower GLP-1 receptor affinity as compared to the endogenous GLP-1 that we have. It has already been approved for diabetes as well as uh, weight management, but we don't have it. It's available in the rest of the world uh, just to share the results, in phase two and phase three trials, weight loss of up to 22.5% have been seen over 72 weeks. Mind you, in overweight, obese individuals, this was the first time that we were getting results to the tune of bariatric surgery. And also significant benefits in A1C reduction and weight loss in type 2 diabetes patients. Again, I keep mentioning that because type 2 diabetes patients do not lose weight that easily as someone without diabetes but overweight and obese. Now, GL GLP-1 receptor agonists and GIP antagonists. Uh, GIP antagonists, I mentioned the GIP agonism earlier, but antagonists also seem to be working well for obesity. And it seems that there are similar effects on weight of both agonism and antagonism at GIP because of the potential desensitization of the receptors when we use GIP agonists uh, well. So again, there is an amgen molecule uh, which is to be given subcutaneously every four weeks. Again, the, uh, the regimen could be very attractive and has shown up to 15% weight loss as compared to placebo by day 85. But, uh, and the side effects were pretty similar to other drugs in the class. So phase two results are awaited, but let's see how this goes. So this is GLP-1 receptor agonist and GIP antagonist dual molecule together. Now we come to a very exciting uh, combination, 
GLP-1, we know the benefits. And then glucagon coagonist, glucagon primarily has a lot of impact on the liver. And let's go, uh, go through what happens. It increases hepatic glucose production, reduces food intake, and increases energy expenditure. And all this has been proven with a long-acting glucagon analog in uh, the preclinical studies. Uh, what is of concern is that it causes a reduction in the amino acids in the bloodstream. Uh, I was there at EAST a few days ago, and, uh, and, uh, and BI uh, themselves presented this, and they themselves were not very sure of what the long-term impact would be. They just said there is a moderate reduction in the amino acids, but we'll see as the safety data accumulates. So far, it's looking great in terms of uh, reducing weight without uh, compromising on the glycemia. So servodutide is a shining example from Boringer Ingelam, and this is a GLP-1 and glucagon receptor coagonist. We already know the effects. I told you primarily it's going to work in the liver to reduce steatosis and all the other uh, actions required for uh, weight loss. So it is uh, being evaluated when we have the phase two results. It's also now in the phase three, the synchronized program that's going on in clinical development. Uh, so let's see that 46 weeks of servodutide once weekly from 0.6 to 4.8 milligrams resulted in a dose dependent weight loss of up to 18.7 kilo uh, percent as compared to placebo. But let's also understand uh, 20 to 30 percent participants did discontinue medication, and hence they are going to evaluate other dosing regimens uh, in phase three. So this is the result in weight loss, HbA1c, etc. And servodutide also has the fast track designation from the F FDA for reduction in liver fat and is being positioned for MASH and fibrosis as well. Uh, Next, we come to masdutide. Again, it's a GLP-1 and glucagon coagonist. Although the weight loss was acceptable with this molecule, the benefits in HbA1c reduction were not that significant. And masdutide is also in phase three at different dose levels. Higher dose levels are being evaluated. And uh, we'll see how well that works. But so far, so good. The results in, weight in terms of weight loss have been more than 10% uh, at least. Pembidutide, again, that's the GLP-1 and glucagon coagonist. Uh, here, they, we have significant weight loss, but no improvement in HbA1c. And uh, it's currently now being positioned for MASH and undergoing phase two trials. Efinopegdutide, uh, it's a tongue twister, but I managed to say it. It's being granted fast track approval by the uh, fast track designation by the FDA for the treatment of MASH. And there are other GLP-1 and glucagon coagonists as well in early phase clinical trials for obesity, including something from AstraZeneca and Lilly. Now we come to triple agonists. I'm just going to take two minutes more, please. Uh, triple agonists uh, with GLP-1, GIP, and glucagon. We talked about GLP-1, we talked about GIP, and now adding glucagon to the same. Retatrodide, a fantastic molecule in phase three at the moment. Uh, chemically, as compared to the native hormones, it is three times less potent on the glucagon receptor, nine times more effective on the GIP-1, and 2.5 times less potent on GLP-1. So again, the star seems to be GIP agonism uh, right here, just similar to terzapatide. This is from Eli Lilly and company as well. It, although it's in phase three, the phase two data was fantastic, dose-dependent uh, reduction in weight, more than 10%, and even uh, not stopping even at the end of the trial, which means that patients would have continued to lose weight if they were continued on the uh, therapy. 
So triumph is what is going on, and they're also expanding the indications to those with osteoarthritis, OSA, cardiovascular and chronic kidney disease, and uh, again, the approval, they're so sure that it's getting approved and it's uh, slated for quarter four, 2027. Amylin agonism, we know pramlintide, everybody is aware of that. There was weight loss with that molecule as well, but it's cagrinlintide, which is a longer acting amylin ag analog, which got significant weight loss. And now it's being the most exciting part about it is its combination with semaglutide. The results from the phase B, 1B trial over 20 weeks have been fantastic. 17.1% reduction in weight as compared to 95 with semaglutide, uh, 2.4 milligrams. And uh, again, the frequency of both is once weekly and uh, the dose is, as, uh, is also 2.4 milligrams for either of them. In those with overweight, obese, and type 2 diabetes, there was a meaningful reduction in HbA1c as well. So the next big thing on the horizon is cagri uh, I'm not going into details of PYY and also bimagrumag. Just it suffices to say that these are molecules which will probably prevent uh, the lean muscle mass loss, which is a huge problem that we see with weight loss medications. There's also combinations of GDF factor 15. Again, similarly, it will cause weight loss, but not the lean muscle mass loss. So we are indeed in a new era of obesity management, and uh, they can be used singularly or in tandem with bariatric surgery or uh, in tandem with intensive lifestyle choices, which are definitely needed. And uh, hence, we need to have a multi-pronged approach to uh, to actually tackle this problem. So in terms of uh, summary, well, the safety data, I did not go through the detail, but all the uh, side effects reported so far with each of these molecules were similar to the incretin-based therapy, and uh, uh, they, most of the discontinuation rates were 20%, unless I specified where there were more discontinuation rates due to AEs. So it's definitely an exciting new era. We have on the backbone of GLP-1 receptor agonists, we have so many other combinations and singular molecules. Uh, and uh, the two best things that are coming up is the cagri semer and retartrutide, the triple agonist, GLP, GIP, as well as the glucagon agonist. And that will help us bridge this gap between medical management and bariatric surgery. Both are in phase three, so expect the approval anytime. We also have oral or forgliprone and danugliprone and oral semaglutide at higher doses, which are also going to be uh, replenishing this entire dearth or scarcity of drugs that we have today. So with this, thank you very much. I thank Dr. Banshi Sabusar and team Diacare Corn for this patient hearing.